Well, let me invite you to take your copy of God's Word and open with me to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, I want to say thank you to the worship team for leading us this morning so beautifully uh, to see the glory and the grandeur of God. Um, those lyrics ministered to me as I prepared to step into this, this pulpit and uh, caused me to see God in a greater light. And so thank you for that. It's good to see Isaac there on the keyboards, first time uh, up there on the keyboards. So thank you, Isaac, for stepping in. You know, we, we are blessed here with so many that uh, God has given uh, talents and skills that can step in and, and play and lead in so many different ways, not only on this platform, but uh, all over whatever is happening in this church. Amen? And so if you have not found a place uh, to, to plug in and serve, we would, we would encourage you to do so. Matthew 5, this morning we come to, um, coming close to the end uh, of this series, our summer series, The Fruit of the Spirit. And this morning we are addressing gentleness. Uh, and some of you come to this, this idea with certain notions, and so we're going to deal with this head on today. I want to just give you the sort of the heads up. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we will finish out uh, this summer series talking about self-control. And uh, so, uh, ready for that. And then after that, I'm planning to start the book of Ruth. And I want us to walk through the book of Ruth together. It's one of my favorite books. It's a great story of the gospel. And so I look forward to the start of a, a new school year, a new church year, and a brand new book of the Bible. So I would encourage you to, to be reading and also to be thinking about who you can invite to, that, to come that needs to hear the gospel in the story of Ruth. So that's my shameless plug uh, to prepare you for going into the fall. Matthew 5, let me read one verse for you this morning. Verse 5, this is from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And in verse 5, Matthew 5, he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This morning, we come to this issue of meekness or gentleness. And, uh, and, and we have quite a lot of confusion on the subject. Let me just give you a little illustration. This past week, I struggled with gentleness. And you, you look at me and you say, I, I can't imagine that. You look like the most gentle, meek guy in, on the planet. But this past week, I struggled with, with gentleness at the gym. I uh, went into the gym, and typically when I go into the gym, we're doing CrossFit, and we do all these different you know, Olympic weightlifting and different things, and, and I, I feel pretty good about what we're doing some of the time. Some of the time, I'm, I'm completely lost, and it would be quite entertaining if you would just place a camera uh, in my gym and just watch the feet of me. But some weeks, I feel okay. This week... This particular exercise was terrible, okay? We had to do bear crawls. Anybody familiar with bear crawls? All those high school athletes, you know what bear crawls are. You know those very well. You're getting down literally on your hands and your feet, and you're crawling around the room like this big bear. Well, it's, it's not pleasant. It's hard on your shoulders. It is, it, is a, it is a tough move. But typically, I can go through bear crawls back and forth, and I can get through them pretty, pretty well. I don't, I'm not great, but I'm, I'm okay. Well, this day, our coach said, I want you to go get a five-pound plate, which is just this five-pound weight that goes on the, uh, normally on a bar. And he said, I want you to place the, the five-pound plate on the small of your back. I thought, five pounds? Got this. All day long, got five pounds in me. Well, the objective was to bear crawl with a five-pound plate on your back. And if it fell off your back, you had to do ten burpees on the spot. You had to crawl 100 meters down and 100 meters backwards in a bear crawl. Well, I made it okay for the first going forward. I was slow, but I made it to the end, and it did not fall off. I started coming backwards. Do you see? these? My legs are long, right? And so my legs and my arms are not the same. So with me typically in a bear crawl, pardon the, the picture here, but, but my hind end is up in the air, right? I, no bear in the woods looks like I look when I'm doing a bear crawl, right? So I'm having to balance this, this five-pound plate on the small of my back, which means i got to get low in my legs and extend my arms completely. And I'm trying to go backwards with this thing without this thing falling off because I certainly don't want to do these burpees. I look like the world's biggest, most awkward sloth. Uh, as I'm trying to do this. It's, no, it's the sloth crawl is what it turned into. Finally, everyone is back in, this, in the class I was in, and I'm still out in the middle of the floor, 
and I'm inching backwards, and members of the class come over to me and they start giving me advice. No, no, Scott, do this. No, no, Scott, do this. And I'm wanting to say, shut up. <laughs> Finally, the coach comes over and he has mercy on me and he says, that's okay, Scott, you're good. <laughs> I had trouble with gentleness. Because normally with the big weights, the big movements, I can just fling those, right? Those are, that's what this is vernacular that me and a buddy use there. We just fling those weights. Our form may not be great, but we can get the, the weights in the air. But this was not flinging. This was finesse. This was strength under control. And that's what gentleness is. We need to come to this issue when Jesus here says, Blessed are the meek, or the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. We need to come to this issue of gentleness, and we need a definition. First off, let me tell you uh, what gentleness is not. A couple of things here, maybe three things. First off, gentleness is not a disposition. It's not just this natural uh, temperament of a person. It's not just that quiet, mild-mannered, wouldn't-hurt-a-fly person. One of our favorite shows that we watch together as a family is Everybody, Everybody Loves Raymond. Anybody else watch Everybody Loves Raymond? Okay, I see a hand back there. I love Everybody Loves Raymond. The characters on it are great. If you're familiar with this, you're going to get this. If not, you're going to be like, who is that? We think of a disp gentleness as a disposition like Amy's mother, uh, Pat McDougal, on Everybody Loves Raymond. Okay, those are, there's like five people in here chuckling. You'll go home and Google it. Please don't Google it right now. Um, this is, the, you know, the enemy of, of pastors today is everyone has a smartphone and people can, you know, search in the middle of my sermon. Don't do that now. But that's what we think of. Wouldn't hurt a fly. Wouldn't say a negative word. Just mild-mannered. But the Bible says that that's not what it's talking about. You know, in Numbers chapter 12, the Bible called Moses the meekest man on earth. You think, Moses, the meekest man on earth? He, he led a nation. He led the Israelites out of Egypt. He's the meekest man on earth. What do we know about Moses? We know looking back that he wasn't always meek. That before he led his fellow Israelites out of Egypt, he became so enraged one day at the abuse of one of his brothers that he, he murdered a man. And he tried to cover it up and he fled for his life. I would not call that strength under control. I would call that strength out of control, right? So when the Bible here says that Moses is the meekest man on the planet, this is not a disposition. It's not like, well, Moses is just this mild-mannered guy. Moses goes out into the wilderness, and it takes God roughly 40 years to make him the meekest man on the planet. It's something that we can become. Not only is it not a natural disposition, but it's not gender-specific either. In our culture today, sometimes we, as a society, think that, that when we talk about gentleness, we are thinking of a feminine characteristic. That in general, and this is a stereotype, I know, this is a big swath with a big broad brush here, but we think of women as being uh, more, more um, gentle, more nurturing, more, more caring, more, more into hugging, uh, all those sort of things. That's a big swath. I know my wife's looking at me like, what, what in the world are you talking about? Because that's not my wife, right? But this is a big, big stereotype. That typically, this is a feminine characteristic. I think typically, if we talked about gentleness and we said, well, how would we identify gentleness if, if we were talking about bathroom doors? You know how you go into some restaurants and, and you, whatever it is, it says like, you know, cow pokes and, you know, whatever. And you got to stand there and go, well, what am I, right? Well, if we're talking bathroom doors with gentleness, I think we'd, gentleness is here and we think, oh, that's the ladies' room. And over here was brutal, that's the, that is the guys, you know. But that's not it either. The, here, Paul doesn't, or, or Jesus, I'm sorry, doesn't make any distinction between the genders. This is, gentleness is not something that is reserved for women over men and, 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 and vice versa. Instead, it is given to both men and women equally. Gentleness is not this natural disposition, it's not gender-specific. And neither is it weakness. Sometimes we think that gentleness is a sign of powerlessness. That meekness, the word that Jesus uses, is equated with weakness. And this is not the picture the Bible gives us. Let me go back to the, the uh, example of Moses. 
You don't lead over a million people out of Egypt the way Moses did and be powerless. He was a powerful guy. Can you imagine doing some of the things that he did, going and standing before Pharaoh and, and saying the things that he did? Bringing these promises of plagues every day, throwing down your staff and it becoming a serpent and eating the other serpents of, the, of his magicians. It's not a powerless guy. This is a powerful guy, and, and he's meek. Jesus himself called himself gentle and lowly, yet what do we see Jesus doing? While he was on, on, uh, on earth walking around, he went into the temple when they were uh, selling uh, the, the sacrifices at extreme prices and exchanging money and, and all these things. He, Jesus walks in and he turns over the tables and he makes a whip and he drives them out of the temple. Does that sound like a powerless guy? This is Jesus, when he was there, when he was on earth, demons shook in his presence and fled. When Jesus walked on the planet, he went to the most powerful, influential men of the day, which would have been the Pharisees and, and the scribes, as far as in the Jewish world, and he called them things like snakes and sons of Satan and whitewashed tombs. Those are not exactly things you'd put on your license plate, right? These are, these are harsh sayings. That every power of heaven, every resource within the Godhead was Jesus, it was his to be had, yet he silently goes all the way to the cross and displays for us what it is to be gentle. So I would say to you that gentleness is not weakness. Our society views strength and gentleness as, as opponents, but the Bible paints strength and, and gentleness as inseparable friends that they go together so what is gentleness well literally the bible says that that it means strength under control let me give you some some just understanding about what this how this plays out in your life gentleness is the means of your salvation and mine it is the means of our salvation. Psalm 18.35 says, You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand supported me, and your gentleness made me great. I want you to fathom the control that God displayed not to just pour out wrath on us in our sin. I sat there and we sang those songs this morning. We sang these things of, of you reached down your hand to me and you pulled me out of the pit. That, that you've, you've set my feet on solid rock. And I think, I'm thinking, what, what gentleness God has shown. Because what he should have done is he should not have reached his hand down to us or set our feet on a rock. Instead, he should have taken that rock and crushed us beneath the weight of his holiness. But instead, he displays this gentleness toward us in the gospel. I mean, think about it. If you've got a pesky fly, I shared this a couple weeks ago, but I'll use it again. A pesky fly flying and buzzing around you. How long does it take you to take care of that fly? I mean, we even have these guns now. Have you seen these things that shoot like a spray of salt? Like we, we you know, take flies out in midair. Have you guys seen those? Sometimes I can't see you through the lights, but yeah, you're, you're there. You know, you, we have a gun now that we can shoot flies out of the air. My, you want one now, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> My wife's going, what? Yeah, we've got to have one. Most of you, when you see a snake out in your yard or in your house, what do you do? I mean, we, we, have, we have sayings like, the only good snake's a dead snake, right? Because most of you, you see a snake around and you're going to take the head off the snake. Imagine if God treated us the way we treated flies and snakes. We deserve to be treated like them. We were lower than them. We are less significant than them. Yet God, in his mercy and his grace, with every resource of heaven at his disposal, looks at us and controls that strength and shapes it and fashions it in, in the form of Jesus going to the cross on our behalf. Gentleness is the means of our salvation. Secondly, gentleness is a mark of Christ-likeness. 
gentle mark of Christ's likeness. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus himself calls himself gentle and he displays it. Isaiah chapter 42 verses 1 through 3 really kind of characterize the gentleness of Jesus in, in his interaction with others. There's a famous passage there, Isaiah 42, that says, A bruised reed he will not break, and, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. You know, Jesus, we see him walking the planet, and we see him being gentle. And we see him with bruised reeds all the time. You know, Jesus didn't treat every single person the same way. He didn't interact with them always the same way. But the Pharisees, I've already told you, that he would go to these Pharisees who their hearts were hardened. They, they weren't bruised. They, were, they, they, felt, they found themselves to be strong, right, in their own self-righteousness. And Jesus speaks to them in a certain way. He calls them snakes and sons of, of Satan and, and, and uh, whitewashed tombs and other things. And he calls them to repent. But did he do the same thing with the woman caught in adultery? When the woman caught in adultery is brought to him, and they fling her at, her, at his feet, wearing no clothes, and, and, and they say to her, what, the, the law says we should stone her, what do you say? You remember what Jesus did? Jesus kneels down, begins to draw in the dust, stands up, and he says, let the one who doesn't have any sin cast the first stone. The Bible says that one by one they dropped their rocks and went away. And it's just Jesus here standing with this woman, nobody else around, and he does not turn and, and talk to her the same way he talked to the Pharisees. He doesn't turn and talk to her and say, you snake, you son of Satan. No, instead he says, where are those who condemned you? They're not here. Go and sin no more. And this bruised reed, he will not break. And for you and I to display gentleness is to, is to be like Christ. For you and I to control the strength. I mean, who has more strength in this day than the believer? We talked about this when we've gone through, through Ephesians and 1 Peter together. That every single resource of heaven is yours and mine in Christ. There's not a politician on a hill anywhere. There, there's, not a, there's not an entertainment mogul anywhere that has more power at their fingertips than the believer. The Bible tells us that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Yet when you and I, through the power of the Spirit of God, exhibit gentleness and we control that strength, and we, we see other people through God's eyes, and we, we don't seek to break the bruised reed, we are acting like Jesus. Third, I would think, I would say, is that gentleness not only is this means of our salvation and a mark of Christ's likeness, but third is it's a mark of God-centeredness. It's, it's in your life when you are gentle, it's accepting God's will for your life. This is what James says in James 1, 19 through 21. He says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear Slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant, wick rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. One of the marks of, of meekness or gentleness, one of the things that it means beyond uh, power under control, the way the Bible uses it, is often that we would accept whatever God has for our life, that we wouldn't argue, that we, would, that we would say, God, you are sovereign, you are Lord, you love me more than I love myself, you have my, my, my good at heart, so no matter what I go through, Lord, I know that ultimately, Romans 8, 28 tells me that it will work together for my good because I love you. This is, this is gentleness. We can display gentleness by receiving with meekness the implanted word. We know the will of God largely because he's given it to us. We don't have to wonder and say, what is the will of God in this area? Because in so many areas, God has said, this is the will of God. This is my will. But sometimes even in those areas where it's unclear, 
You say, well, there's, not a, there's no verse there that tells me whether I should take this job or that job. There's not a verse there that says that I should marry this person or, or, or this person. Even there, sometimes God, through His Spirit, will show you what His will is. And sometimes it, it, it's not always going to be what you wanted it to be. And Garth Brooks knew that. You know, thank God for unanswered prayers, right? Sometimes it's not always what you would have it to be. But, but gentleness is accepting it. It's saying, Lord, you are sovereign. You're good. So, Lord, I trust you. The basic definition from the Greek lexicon for gentleness sums it up pretty well. It says that gentleness is not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. It's not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. What that means is that you and I aren't so important that we don't need a Savior. You will not one day leave this world, leave this life through death, and stand at the, the gates of heaven and strut your way in. You will not name drop your way in. There's not a person alive who has ever lived or who ever will live, barring Jesus, who does not need a Savior. It also means that you aren't the point, that I'm not the point, that Jesus is the point. So many times we get ourselves in trouble because we think that, that my preference, what I want, should take precedent. Jesus is the point. Gentleness means that you're not the star in your own story. That you and I are, are this is not a, a made-for-TV movie starring you. That instead, this is God's story. All of life, all of history is God's story where we get to play extra roles in it. We, we may simply be someone sitting at a cafe table in the back, being faithful to have a conversation with a coworker. Maybe the, the, that may be the, the bulk of all that we do in this story, but it is ultimately not our story, it's God's. So here's the final question that I would ask this morning is, how do we know if we're growing in gentleness? How do we know if we're growing in this? Well, there's two sides of this. We grow, it shows up with one another, and it shows up in our relationships with those outside of the family of God. So first, we grow, how do we know, with one another inside the family of faith? Well, question, are you bearing with one another in love? This is a mark of gentleness. Ephesians 4, 1 and 2 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. The question points to a reality when I say, are you bearing with one another in love? The question is, are you a real member of this church? You say, well, yeah, my name's on the roll. It's always been on the roll. Since I was a kid, it was a, I've been on the roll. Is that all it takes to be a member of a church? You see, the, the biblical idea of membership is bearing with one another in love. Are, are you content to simply come in and, and take your seat in a Sunday morning gathering and, and, and then walk out unchanged and remain anonymous and not ever contribute anything to the life of the family called this Abner Creek Baptist Church? If that's the case, then I would tell you you are not a gentle believer because the mark of a gentle believer is that he bears with one another in love. She bears with one another in love. We, we take up a paddle in this boat together and we all row. We don't sit back and say, well, I'm going to let everybody else row. We don't sit back with our checkbooks and say, you know, I'm going to let other people give. Because I don't make enough to give. No, we say, God's called me to be sacrificial in what he's given, with me, given to me. He's been so generous with me. I may not have as much as so-and-so or so-and-so, but I have what I need. And everything I have that I need is from him. And therefore, I will be generous back to him. I'm going to pick up the paddle, and I'm going to row with the rest of this congregation. My paddle may not be as big. My paddle may feel like, at times, a spoon. And someone else has this, this big oar, right? But it's still contributing to where we're going are you bearing with one another in love 
Second question, are you consumed with your own self-importance or with the value of others? James 3.13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Basically, what James is saying there is, you know, sometimes you may have the answer, but it may not be the right time to share the answer. Right? Like, sometimes a person is not as wise as they think they are. You ever known a person who always is the smartest person in a room, and they're not afraid to let you know it? You know, I don't know where this quote actually came from, but Abraham Lincoln is who it's attributed to. And it's better to remain silent and be thought of fool than to open one's mouth and, remo- and remove all doubt. Sometimes, sometimes you can be in the middle of, of, of company and you think, man, I know the answer. I know the answer. Nobody else knows the answer. They're all saying the wrong thing. Everyone's saying just dumb stuff because I know the answer. And sometimes it's right to speak up and say, no, no, this is right. But other times, if, if all you're doing is trying to validate yourself and to show yourself to be the smartest person in the world, you, you might need to hold your tongue. Sometimes, even if it's true, it's better left unsaid. That's why Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion. Sometimes it's just unfitting. You, by, by always speaking up and always having to have the answer, You're not considering the people around you. You're not valuing them. You just want to show your dominance above them. And if it it means you have to step on their heads to make yourself look taller, you're willing to do it. And if that's the case, I would tell you, you are not being a gentle brother or sister. Third, are you concerned for holiness in the family of God? Galatians 6 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is, is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves lest you be lest you too be tempted. You know, this is one of those things, church discipline, people kind of push back from this. There was a time when when churches by and large all practiced church discipline. It's a normal thing if you go back probably somewhere in the, in the records of, of this congregation years and years and decades ago, you will find records of so-and-so being dismissed from the body from, for unrepentant sin. You go back through all of these churches, especially one as old as we are, 1832, this is a normal thing that people shy away from this because they think, how pretentious of us to think that I somehow have it all together and I could tell a brother or sister that what they're doing is wrong. But Jesus here prescribes it. Paul here, Galatians 1, says, You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And what that means is some confrontation sometimes. It's not the prettiest thing. It's not the most, you know, hey, we're going to sign up. Who wants to be the disciplinarian? No one wants to do that. But we're called to it. What it doesn't mean, it, it doesn't mean that you are the congregational Barney Fife. You're not to walk around with your, with your ticket book, with your whistle, and your, your one bullet. Maybe a World War II motorcycle with, complete with a sidecar. That's, that's not your responsibility. We're not looking for people that are always saying, ah, you know, nip it, right? That's not what we're called to. In fact, Jesus, before he ever tells us to restore the other person, prescribes for us that we would evaluate ourselves and perform surgery at home. He says there in Matthew 7, why do you point out the speck in your brother's eye and ignore this huge log that's coming out of yours? First take care of that, remove that, and then you'll be able to see clearly how to help your brother. See, the mandate is not don't help your brother. The mandate is evaluate yourself in light of the gospel and the word of God. And where there is sin, repent. Where there's command, obey. And when you're living there, when you're living in the grace of the gospel, then you'll be able to see clearly that when a brother or a sister begins to stray and they are harming themselves and they are harming the witness of the church and they are harming ultimately the, the, the glory of God in, in view of a community, that it is a responsibility for us to go to them and say, brother, you're in sin, I would call you to repent. Matthew 18 lays this out. 
and I've gone over it several times, so I won't belabor the point any, any longer. But the question for us is, if, if, to, to know that we are growing in gentleness, the question is, are we concerned for holiness in the family of God? There should be true concern there that we are a holy people. We should be gentle with one another. You know, this correcting or restoring is always to be done in gentleness. But it is to be done. So that's how do you know within the, within the faith family. Last, I'll, I'll end with this. How do you know if you're growing in gentleness by looking at the people outside of the faith family? Well, a question here is, do you treat all people with respect? Or do you reserve the right to disrespect for certain people? Perhaps economic status, skin color, religion. Maybe you reserve the right to to disrespect based on some of those things, but the Bible would not allow us to do so. Titus 3, 1 and 2 says, Remind them to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. I don't know about you, but it doesn't take a whole lot of study in, in the original language to figure out what all means. All means all. That no matter who you encounter, in person or otherwise, social media, figure on on the news or or whatever, every single person you will ever encounter is created in the Imago Dei. They're created in the image of God. And what that means is that they are worthy of respect. They are worthy of dignity. They are not someone to be put off and shunned and put away. It is not okay to to gather together in certain groups and cliques and, and to push others outside. We are to treat one another with respect. The second question here to know if you're growing in gentleness, are you more concerned about their soul than you are about being right? 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. See, I'm convinced that for so many, evangelism looks like being right. Evangelism is equal to winning the argument. That is not evangelism. Evangelism is holding out the hope that Jesus lived in your place the perfect life you couldn't live, and that he died the death that you deserved. So that if you would turn from your sin and trust him, your sins would be forgiven. And you would be given a home with him forever. And he's going to conform you to the image of Christ. That's the gospel. It's not winning an argument. You know, it takes the pressure off when you don't have to win the argument that you can just simply extend grace and hope. It doesn't mean that we don't call sin, sin. We certainly call sin, sin. But I think there's so many people that, uh, that think that that has become the objective Let me point out what's wrong here without ever extending the hope of the gospel. There's still a call to correct wrong ideas about truth, but for their repentance, not for your validation. So those are just some ways that you can evaluate your life. And am I growing in gentleness? You know, as we look at these fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, if you you run the analogy and you, you take fruit in everyday life, you take an apple or an orange or something on your counter and you pick it up. You know, fruit is meant to be sweet to the eater, right? You're meant to take that thing and pick up that apple and bite it. And it should be crisp and sweet to the taste. You should peel that orange and it be, it'd be sweet and, and just a great orange. You ever picked up a piece of fruit that wasn't ripe yet and taken a bite of it? Not really a pleasant experience, right? See, the analogy for us is that when the Bible here calls us to be growing in fruit, it's not something that we can produce, but I think sometimes we, we think that we are somehow the consumers of the fruit, that we are the eaters. And that when the Bible here in Galatians 5 says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that somehow that is for us to consume and it ought to be sweet to us. 
But the Bible's not calling us to be the consumers. The Bible the, tells us that God is producing in us through the Spirit these fruit of the Spirit so that those that we encounter would take of that fruit, they would taste, and it would be sweet to their, to their tongue. And because of that, they would have this sweet disposition toward God. That they would see Him for what He really is. You, you and I are not called to be mere consumers in this thing of Christianity. Instead, we are to be those who are, who are giving out samples. We're to be the, the lady in Costco, right? Would you like to try? That's our role. My question to you, the final question of the day is this. When someone tastes the fruit of your life as a believer... Is it sweet? Or would they say, whew, I know what they say, but that thing's not ripe yet. That's sour. May we grow in gentleness as believers. Let's pray.